All right, welcome everyone to September's AI in Action. It's hard to believe the summer's already gone. Um, it's a, he, he can turn that down. And uh, uh, it's beautiful weather now, the heat is broke. Um, kids are back to school, and I think people have taken the opportunity to actually enjoy the nice weather. We've had a few people that canceled at the last minute. I think they're playing a little bit of hooky outside, the nice weather. Um, but anyways, to this, this, uh, this, this month we have um, uh, a couple of guest speakers here. Uh, we've got Austin Smith, who's part of Kingsman Software, is one of our directors of software engineering. Software engineering. Uh, we have Philip Dodds um, from Codexa, guest presenter here. Um, and together we're going to show three demos about document ingestion. And we're also going to do a little bit of um, uh, education about some of the techniques you use for document ingestion. All right. But before we start, I get some feedback that the last one was a little bit dry. And so we're adding a little bit of entertainment value, a little bit of an icebreaker, nothing to do with document ingestion. It's just kind of a fun. Um, it's fun, a little disturbing, but, <laughs> but kind of fun. Um, you remember Muppets growing up? Uh, and then you also remember Mad Max growing up? What happens if you put those two together and make a little AI movie? It's so good, but it's so awkward. <laughs> now, if you look at this closely, these are all three or four second little snippets. That's a technique, right, where you take an image, you manufacture an image, and you ask one of the models to make a little video of it. You, you, part, you put those together, and you build a little movie here. We don't have to watch the whole thing, but just know this might be the future of filmmaking. Frank's, Frank loves this. You, put the, you posted this, didn't you? <laughs> Jim Henson might be rolling over in his grave. <laughs> anyway, we don't have to watch any more of that. I should be starring in it. Okay. Icebreaker aside. <laughs> yeah, I'm an animal, right? Yeah, he was in it. All right, so we bring this slide up every time to bring context, right? AI has lots of different components to it, lots of different capabilities, and today we're talking about content analysis, right? So we're going to take text that we already have and we're going to inspect it and understand it. Um, we just did video generation with Muppets, um, but we're focusing on content. All right, my favorite slide, show me. These are the four things we're going to go through. Victorious, Victorious is a demo. Uh, I'll do that one, and then we're going to overview what RAG techniques are, retrieval augmented generation. Uh, Austin will do auto ingest, um, and then Philip will show Codexa. All right, so let's start off with Victorious. Got some music here. So we give our teams mission possibles, we call them. And so once every quarter, they get a, a project to go work on, and they go do that. I'll turn the music down here. Um, and they go do that, and we get these demos out of it. So we have like 50 demos so far of, of using AI. And so this one was built by Madison and Reagan. For those who don't remember, the Mission Possible is the Impossible Mission Force, IMF, right? Ethan, Ethan Hunt, right, yeah. Um, so Madison and, and Reagan built this for us, um, and so we want to give them some credit for that. Uh, but I, I gave them a task. I said, hey, I have a lot of companies that work in you know, debt syndication, equity syndication, and they get all these prospectuses, and they are really big, honking documents. This is a 71-page document, um, and they're ugly, and they're, they kind of look the same, but they kind of don't look the same because each deal is very different. Maybe you've heard of NVIDIA. I don't know. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, but as you're on the desk and you're trying to understand what all these deals are, you really take one of your analysts and you say, okay, go read this 71-page document and figure out what it means. Like, what are all the different clauses? How many tranches are there? What are the interest rates? What are the tenors? Things along those lines. And so let me flip over to the demo. And what, what, what is this authorized every hour? Yeah, just, just click that twice. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so here's our demo. This, by the way, this is our demo list of demos. These are demos that we've built. These are demos that we can demo. 
I've got a lot of stuff here. But let's get into this one. I'll go into Victorious and open up a different window. Okay. So I have these different documents. If I go to PDFs, uh, we've got an Exxon document, we've got an Intel document, we've got an NVIDIA document. So they all kind of look the same, but if you look at them in, de in detail, like this one is a 50 page, somewhere it says 50 page maybe, um, but uh, yeah, 54 page. You know, it goes through some of the details here, and then there's a whole bunch of text in the table contents, and, and these are really ugly. And every time we go look at one of these things, we want the same information every time. And so all we do is in Victorious, we just set our context and say, we want a debt syndication agreement. You can see we've um, done other things as well, loans and whatnot, a resume as well. And then we pick the model we want to use, right? Models change all the time. Some are better, other things. So you can try out which ones work best for you. We're going to use 4.0 four right now. Set that context. And then I can help you find the file. Let's just use Exxon. And it's going to spend a little bit of time processing it. Now, what it's doing, and we're going to show this in a minute, but I want to show you the trick first and then show how the trick is done. But we want to ask the same 10, 20 questions each time we look at one of these documents, like who is the issuer? In this case, it was Exxon. And, and what are the different tranches? And what are the interest rates? And what are the tenors? And uh, what's the use of proceeds? And who's the, um, uh, the managing agent? Like all these different questions you want to ask at the same time. And I don't have to go type in the prompts every time. And so it just does it all at once. We get the results. I can expand this a little bit. And this describes, OK, so issuer is ExxonMobil. Nations are 2,000, um, uh, interest rates, et cetera. And so put all that information out, optional redemption clauses, power call dates, use of proceeds, trustees, et cetera. And then you can start chatting with the document. So let me chat with it. So I ask it a question. And it lists the number of companies that are underwriting this bond. So you can go back and forth. Now imagine that you had a portfolio of these things, right? Because we just got these off the, the um, Edgar website. These are all publicly available documents. Um, but there's probably 10 of these a week. And so having to keep up with 10 a week and then have an entire database of these things is where the real value comes in, not necessarily ingesting one, but by ingesting 10 per week and now having history uh, and being able to, to take all that data, synthesize it together, and look for trends. All right, so, so that's how Victorious works. And if I can go back to here, I'm going to explain now how it works. That was in case it didn't work. <laughs> but luckily it worked. Woohoo! They're demos, right? They're, they're notoriously finicky. So how do you train your model? And this is where Frank is cringing up in the audience. I can hear him. Um, because people say things like, oh, how do you use the model to train it on all my debt syndication agreements? And the answer is you're not really training the model. That's not really what you're doing. Um, you don't need a whole bunch of NVIDIA A100 cards that you have in a server somewhere with big fans on it, and they're $100,000 a piece. You don't train your model like that in this scenario. You use what's called Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG for short. That was a fun slide. So this is the way that works. We start off with our document, right? We saw the Exxon document. And you divide it into different chunks, right? So it's a 54-page document. We can't send the whole thing in at once. And so we're going to take a couple pages at a time, and we're just going to chunk it out and you know, repeat it several times. And we're turning those words into tokens. And I'll explain that a little further in just a second. But we turn those words into tokens that the models can understand. And then those tokens, which are just individual words, you now need to connect them to each other using some sort of um, semantic meaning. Uh, and you, those create embeddings. Again, I'll explain that in more detail in just a second. And you put all that into a vector database. And now you have a separate side store of, of all your information. Then, when a user asks a question, like what companies are underwriting these bonds, you can then send that question into your vector database and find a relevant snippet of information 
based on your question and grab the information that is most relevant. Then take that relevant information, that context, and load that plus your question into the LLM, no matter what LLM you want to use, and then that will come out with an answer like we saw on the demo. Right, so the LLM, you're not asking it with no context, like tell me about this Exxon deal, because the LLM doesn't know anything about the Exxon deal. And you're not sending the entire Exxon deal in, you're just sending a relevant snippet and saying, from this information, find the information that I want. Right, so it's retrieval augmented generation. Because we've already retrieved some information. So let's go through each one here, the tokenize and creating the embeddings. So to tokenizing, it's just taking text, turning into numbers. So I just put in you know, quick brown fox. And you can see all these different coloring schemes here. The quick brown, and this is really the, and then space quick, and then space brown. Um, and you can see later on there's space the. The dot represents a space. And those turn into numbers. So the with a capital T is 976. Quick is 4853, et cetera. And those are all numbers that GPT-40 understands. But these are just translating words into numbers. And now you've got to take your words and you now need to connect them together so they make sense. So if you take your tokens and you add your vectors, which are your similarities, those equal your embeddings. So here's just a, a visual of what I might mean. If I take words that are very similar in context, like um, large, big, enormous, grand, those words would kind of cluster together. Whereas tiny, minuscule, minute, those might cluster together. And this might be, I don't know, blue, like unrelated. So your words, and this is in just two dimensions, kind of cluster together. Now if you make it three dimensions, four dimensions, and number of dimensions, your words start to connect. So one word might connect to many different things through many different vectors. Here's a better example. If we have these different words, man, woman, boy, girl, prince, etc., and we have three different vectors, femininity, youth, and, and royalty, man does not really check any one of those box. But woman checks the femininity box. And similarly, girl checks the femininity box. So woman and girl are kind of connected through the vector of femininity. Likewise, prince and princess are connected through youth and royalty. And so all of a sudden, you can start to figure out how these different words connect to each other through different reasons. And those are where your embeddings come in, and that's what kind of embeddings look like. This is why AI is just one big math problem. So let's play a little game here. Let's see if you can be our LLM for the day. Uh, so if we start off with king, and we remove the man aspect of king, but we add woman, then what word are we looking for? Queen. Queen, absolutely. You've played this game before, Ken, haven't you? <laughs> all right, let's try another one. Now that we have the idea here, all right? So if we have Paris, and we, and we get rid of the France part, but we add Germany part. Berlin. Berlin. Ken, Ken's, we get him a prize. Rashmi, let's give him a prize. Um, so, you know, likewise, cat and kitten, right? Kitten is youthful, and then we add puppy. We're going to get dog. And then if we add winter, a season, and we subtract cold, and we add hot. Summer. All right. Thank, thanks, SK. All right. So that's the kind of the way this works. That's, the, that's a semantic search. And you, we've seen this throughout our lives. We just maybe didn't know that's what it was. But you know, if you're Netflix or, or you buy something on Amazon and, and, and they say, oh, you bought an iPhone, do you want an iPhone case? Or you're on Spotify and they find the next best song. Semantic search has not been, is not new, right? This has been long, around for a long period of time. So semantic search has just been happening. We just didn't know it was happening. And if you think of like a, uh, if you had a Beyonce song playing like Texas, Texas Hold'em, um, what would be the next, the next best song that you'd play after Beyonce's Texas Hold'em? Well, it might be, another Beyonce song. It might be a Jay-Z song based on, you know, the artist and her husband. It might be um, uh, another song about Texas, like the Yellow Rose of Texas. 
Uh, it might be Poker Face by Lady Gaga because there's a poker aspect to it with Hold'em. And so that's where these kind of go, these connecting, 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 connecting. That's your semantic search. Frank, you can stand up, and if I'm messing this up, you let me know. All right, okay. Fra Frank approved. Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers, right? Yeah. The, the gambler. <laughs> Is that what you listen to, Greg? Kenny Rogers? All right. So now if we go back to this again, same slide, okay? Hopefully this makes a little more sense. We take our document and we take a little piece of it because it's too big to take at once and then we turn it into tokens and then we create those embeddings and our, um, our models will help us do that and we turn it into vector database which is our vector database, right? That's our local store. And then when we ask a question, we go into the vector database and say, show me things that are almost like that. So our question, companies, maybe the document says businesses, or maybe it says bank, or maybe it says financial institutions, but those will all be semantically similar to company. And maybe it doesn't say bonds, but it says notes, um, or debt instruments, right? Those are all semantically similar. And so I might ask a question, what companies are underwriting these bonds? But it might go find stuff that relates to financial institutions that are underwriters of the notes, which in fact is kind of what it did. So it finds a little piece of information that seems to relate to what I'm asking for, and it takes that information and it sends it into the LLM along with my question and says, please go, please go analyze this information that I just sent you. And that's how that works. And then I get the answer back. So that's a little bit under the hood. And then just a, a last uh, educational slide here of, um, you know, the reason that, that RAG is being used is because you really can't put the entire 54-page document into an LLM. Well, at least back then you couldn't. Like, back, back in the old days, like a year ago, um, your context models were much smaller. And so, you know, we all came on the scene when chat GPT-3.5 came out. Um, but even back then, while, while now it is 16,000 tokens, back then it was only like 4,000 tokens. So 4,000 tokens is not a lot. It's, it's take a, like 70% of that, that's the number of words you can load in. Um, so that's not a ton, and you couldn't load in the 54-page document. That's why you have to chunk it and do it yourself and then ask a, a question on a specific piece of, of information. But the number of tokens that the newer models allow you to, I mean, we thought that GPT-4 coming out with 120,000 was great. We'll never need more than that. And then Claude doubled it, and Gemini Pro says, we're going to throw out a million. And then even what, a couple days ago, Magic announced that they're going to have a 100 million token context window. And so you're like, we don't need RAG. Just like throw in your entire document or documents and throw in the entire like Harry Potter series or um, uh, Game of Thrones. Um, and so RAG is dead. Why do we need to do that? Let's just go bring it all to the model and you can figure it out. Like, well, there's, there's, there's two teams here, right? There's, there's definitely the, the team long context, which is just throw it all in. Why even, why even bother? I'll just drop in the entire document. You could do it today. You could just go to ChatGPT and throw in your document. It'd be fine. Um, and RAG is dependent upon that we find the right semantic search, semantic search of the data that we want to send in. So if we find the wrong snippet to send in, it doesn't work. So that's the, the, the advantage of using long, long context. But uh, there's lots of people out there that, you know, in the internet will, internet will tell you that, it, that RAG is not dead yet. So Team RAG will tell you, you're like, so I'm going to load in the entire series of Harry Potter every time I want to ask a question? That's going to take forever. Can I just, like, index that and then ask it specific questions about a certain scene or a certain uh, year of Harry Potter's world? Um, what if I want to ask a question not on one document, one debt prospectus, but I want to see across the past hundred debt prospectuses, what trends are you seeing in the marketplace? So that's where you want, might want to ask it across multiple documents. And then also, you know, using a million tokens is really expensive. And so you can't just, you know, uh, uh, lackadaisically just start using all these tokens because they start charging, charging you based on the tokens. So. Um, uh, using RAG is a little more efficient from a cost standpoint. So this, you know, jury's still out. It's a little bit of a Mac versus PC kind of a thing. Mac is better. Um, but <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, the techniques are evolving. 
that you use. So RAG was built as a technique to get over a certain hurdle. The hurdle's no longer there, but there's still advantages to using it. All right, that's your class for today. If you want your continuing ed credit, uh, you're not getting it. Okay, Austin, it's all you, man. So I'm here to talk to everybody today about a project that we recently worked on for a client. Um, so we've actually transferred that into a demo that I want to show you today. We called it auto-ingest, so it's specifically targeting the mortgage industry in a way to streamline the document ingestion process that they go through. So to start with, uh, we were first approached by a large bank, and they were curious about how they could use LLMs to sort of streamline their mortgage origination process. Now, they, needed, they had very specific needs. They wanted to extract specific values from bank statements. And when I was first approached with it, I was very skeptical because I, you know, if you asked me a year ago, I would have told you LLMs can't do that. It's impossible. There's no way we're going to be able to get the correct data extracted at a uh, reasonable enough accuracy that a bank would accept. But I'm here today to show you that we were able to do it, and I'm still to this day shocked that it actually worked the way that it did. So I'm going to go ahead and swap over to a demo real quick that I can show you. So as Kevin was showing you earlier, we're going to go back over to our Kai demo site, which is kind of where we house any of the demos and showcases that we uh, at Kingsman kind of put together. So specifically, I'm going to walk you through the auto-ingest one. So what auto-ingest is, is um, it's, hold on. There we go. You just got to see some developer magic there. <laughs> um, but anyways, so now that we have our UI correct, you'll notice that um, what we do is we have sort of a landing page here, right? And what this is, is um, this landing page has two documents currently uploaded uh, for different applicants. So what I'm going to walk you through is just a small use case we put together on how you could actually take this process and take it on like just a typical day-to-day -day mortgage loan, uh, sort of like a process for a mortgage loan officer and how they could actually walk through this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to add new here. And you're wondering, what are we going to add? So we have, um, I've got some sample documents prepared here for you. So we're going to go ahead and pull up a sample bank statement here. This one in particular is for someone named Barry Bright. And this is an actual document we used when we were actually going through it. So it's a total dummy statement from Chase Bank. Um, but what you're going to pay attention to here is we are going to go ahead and capture this information up here. Now, what we're going to actually be able to do with this tool is we're going to extract all the key values that you would want out of this document if you're a mortgage loan officer. So we're going to be looking for things like the statement dates up here the account numbers up here, the actual uh, applicant themselves, which is Barry Bright. We're also going to be looking for this application address here, which is this one here. And we're also going to be trying to capture the two different accounts that are on this document. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and swap back to where we had our demo. And we're going to put in Barry Bright. And for our application address, we're going to do 999. Zero four eight. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get our applicant address in. And then the other key field here is the funds to close. So this is going to actually be used. This was a requirement for the client we were working with. Uh, client, uh, applicants needed to have a certain amount of funds to close in order for their documents to be uh, successful when they actually uploaded them. So we're going to put something crazy here. We're going to put a million dollars just so you can see what that looks like. We're going to go ahead and click Save. So now that we have that actually saved, we're going to go ahead and click into Barry Bright. And we're going to click our upload document here. So we're going to click into... Um, we're going 
click back into our sample docs where I was showing that. We're going to have very bright here. So what it's going to do is it's going to do a brief process. It takes about eight seconds for it to actually analyze the document. But what it's going to be doing here is it's actually going to be parsing down this document, breaking everything out of the PDF, and trying to use the LLM to actually extract the key values out of this, the ones that I was uh, talking to you about earlier when we were actually showing the document. Um, so we're going to be looking for the account number, the two different accounts that were on there, and also the applicant address and various other things. So you'll notice we have our application here, so this is good. We, we were able to extract everything correctly. Um, so you'll notice over here we have a view document. This view document actually pulls up. Uh, this is the original document that we were looking at. So your, the mortgage loan officer would actually be able to view this document and everything that was on there, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use this application that we see here to kind of compare and contrast the different things that are up here, right? So. You'll notice at the top up here, what we do is, a specific requirement for the bank was that they wanted to have, um, whenever you uploaded documents, they wanted to be able to actually capture if there were any faults with the document themselves. So the two big faults that we found here was that uh, they had large deposits that were unexpected. So these would be something that was like an ATM deposit or like a check kind of clearing or money being transferred over. So this is something that the bank would actually be looking for to try to get a, uh, some more explanation from the actual person who was applying for the mortgage. So for instance here, they were looking specifically for $5,500 and a $1,200 charge. So if we check over on our document here, we'll notice we have our first account here. And in our first account, we actually have two large deposits. We have a $5,500 and we have a $4,600. The 4,600 is ignored because this is an expected transaction. So this is actually a payroll um, ACH that you'll see on here. So we ignore that because that's an expected transaction. But what we do capture is the 5,500 because it's an ATM deposit. So that would kind of notify the loan officer that, hey, there might be a problem with this document or we need to find a little bit more information about this bank statement. So in addition to that, you're going to notice that there's a lot more fields on here. And I won't go through all of them, but there's things like, you know, did they have all the pages present? Because that was a big requirement. If they're missing key parts of the document, then it's not valid. And also, we're trying to confirm whether or not the statement address that was listed for the applicant is actually the matching statement address up here. But the big thing to note from this is that we were successfully able to actually extract all the key values from this document utilizing the LLMs themselves. So now that we've actually seen the demo for this, I'm going to kind of walk you through um, how we made this all possible. So I said, you know, can it be done? And I proved to myself that it could be done. If you asked me a year ago, I would have said there's absolutely no way. So what really saved us here when we were actually going through this process was Claude 3.5 Sonnet. So what actually happened was this was a six-week engagement with this client where we were going to try to see if this was even possible. So when we were about on the fourth week in, um, Anthropic, which uh, runs the Claude series of models, they actually came out with their 3.5 series. And their 3.5 series um, pretty much saved the day for us. The accuracy was tremendous compared to the 3.0 series. Um, so that's why I have the superhero image here. Um, so the next thing I want to walk you through is what we actually did for the client is we ran a massive bulk job for them to try to get an idea of how all the different models would perform across the same process that I just showed you. So because 3.5 Sonnet performed so well, when we actually did the demo that I just showed you, we went with 3.5 Sonnet. So what you're seeing over here on the left side, these are all the different uh, data points that we were trying to extract from those bank statements. So if you can see over here, 3.5 Sonnet performed significantly better than all of the other models. So they were near 100% accuracy on just about every single field that we wanted to extract from. Uh, the only ones they struggled on were account type and missing pages. But missing pages was a bit of a difficult one because some of the bank statements were formatted. Uh, some of them would be like, you know, page one of four, or they would say like page one, two, three. The ones that were like page one, two, three are very difficult to determine if you're actually missing a page or not because you could have a page one, two, and then you're missing three, and then you have four. That would be okay. But if you just had a page one, two, and three, there was really no way to determine that you were missing page four. So you'd still have to have somewhat of a, a human in the loop in order to kind of ensure that at the end of the day, what you're processing is still accurate. Um, but as you can see, the overall results for this were roughly 97%, whereas the other models were performing significantly worse. Some of them were definitely closer with uh, Claude 3 Opus being around 94% and Turbo being 95%. But the cost per document and the actual time it took to actually run the document was definitely not worth it, because Turbo was almost 26 seconds to process a single set of documents 
whereas Sonnet was roughly eight seconds. So if you look at comparison between 3.5 Sonnet and the 3.0 Sonnet, you're going from roughly 5.3 seconds to eight seconds, but you're increasing by almost 10% in your overall accuracy, which in my opinion are tremendous increases at roughly 0 0.07 of a cent cost increase. So overall, our results were astounding, and I am still baffled that we were actually able to get this to work. So that's all I got for you on that. I think we're going to pass it over to David, or Philip. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, so yeah, I'm Philip Dodds. I am the, I'm the non-Kingsman person, which is a bit scary. But, um, so yeah, I'm here to talk a little bit about Codexa. Um, and we're actually in the document processing space as well. And so we're probably going to repeat some of the things we've just heard, but we'll try and keep it a little bit more interesting if we can and uh, on some new stuff. So uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'm Philip. I'm the CEO. Uh, I've been in IT about 30 years. Uh, I've been in document processing for about the past 13 years, I guess. So I've done varying types of it. From uh, I came from a big data background in Hadoop <clears throat> into machine learning. Actually, my first cut my teeth at a big bank in town. Uh, we processed 29 million PDFs uh, in an attempt to rebuild a, a portfolio, which was a, a fun exercise. And uh, we started Codexa about five years ago. And the aim back then was to uh, basically provide people with tools to do document processing, right? And this was all before generative AI. We were back in the kind of machine learning days. Um, and really, uh, much like the story we just heard, you know, a year and a half ago, we started to run into generative AI, and we saw this huge opportunity to use it against documents. And, and I myself was a little bit kind of, you know, <clears throat> not completely sure it was going to work at the beginning, uh, but it did finally work. So we've been founded in 2010. There's about 13 of us, and uh, we're here in Charlotte. We basically started our business because we'd run into a lot of what we call document drudgery. And we'd seen that through working in more like consulting relationships sort of a decade ago uh, with large banks. And those had been everything from trying to rebalance a large portfolio. You know, you're about to buy 100,000 mortgages. Are they really those mortgages that you're buying? Through to, you know, trying to understand how to capture servicer data, you know, trying to understand how to do NDA analysis, contract analysis. We'd seen huge numbers of these kind of use cases come up. And we felt there was a pattern to them. We felt that there was a way that you could generally solve this problem. And that the problem itself is, call it unstructured data, but really it's like a lot of different use cases, a lot of different problems. And you know, in the past, it was very difficult to solve them because the ROI to invest in building a model, or as you know, we love training models back in the day, was huge. Someone would have to come along and want to spend half a million dollars to start. And there's just lots of these use cases aren't worth half a million dollars, right? Nobody wants to spend that much money to change something that kind of works. And so we wanted to change that fundamentally. And with that's what we really set out to do. And as I said, when we started to see generative AI, we pivoted from being a software development company that builds SDKs for developers. And so we were back building stuff that we would sell to, we should have met Kingsman and sold you stuff, but um, we would have sold to software development companies to help them build technologies to process documents. We saw the opportunity was to go back and kind of directly attack the market kind of as it is. And we've done that, it really pivoted in the last year. Our background is a lot of invoice processing. Uh, we do compliance, we do bill processing, we do what's called checklisting, so that's where you kind of set out the things you expect to find in a document and then validate whether they're there. Like you think about audit control functions. Uh, we do financial data extraction, just as you mentioned, lending, public lending, debt lending. We also do 10K, 10Q, spreading, things like that. Uh, we also do kind of uh, vendor onboarding and things of that nature. And really what's different for us is that we don't do all of those things because we know anything about them which uh, we don't, uh, just to be clear. Uh, we do those things because we basically give people the tools to allow them to work out how to use generative AI so that they can do what they want to do with generative AI on their own, okay? So we sell an enterprise platform tool that end users 
can basically go and attack problems. Okay? Any kind of questions so far? No? All right. I'm trying to be exciting, but I don't have any videos of Muppets, so I fear I'm not sure how that's going to go. All right. Okay. Just off habit. You got this. Just make sure it mutes me so I don't say it twice. I'm terrible at Windows. Here you go. It's running, right? No, it's running. OK. So, so what I've done is I've recorded a video, um, and I'm going to talk through it and kind of describe a little bit about kind of the platform uh, and how it works. So Conexo itself is a cloud-based platform. Uh, we run in Amazon. Um, all of our customers uh, are SaaS customers to us. So we run both private environments. So we have enterprise customers who are processing sort of 300,000 invoices a month. And then we also look for smaller customers who can run in what's called a shared environment, where we offer a shared environment, and that's what's actually being used for this demo. When you're in the shared environment, each of the shared environments is made up of what we call organizations. So just at the top here, it says connect to demo. That's basically for us a way of grouping together projects, resources, documents, all those kind of things so that they can be used uh, by a group of people. And our security model is kind of based on that as well, based on that kind of premise. Now I'm going to be kind of like sitting here wondering how we get to the, the next bit. Hold on. Okay. Come on, Philip, you got this. Ooh. All right. What you're seeing here is a list of projects. And any time you want, you can basically use what we call AI credits, which is a way for you to manage storage. And you can go and create a new project. Projects for us are all based upon project templates. So when we talked, or when you just saw the earlier demo, what we've seen in our life is that typically people have certain sets of documents, and they'll have certain sets of requirements of things they want to get from the documents, right? And those things typically start and evolve very much in the hands of the business. A business person will typically say, hey, you know, I need X, Y, Z to complete my process. What we've typically seen is once they start and they realize they can get it, they come back and they go, wow, if you could get those things really easily, like I want to go and get this, 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 and this, this, this next. And so for us, a project is a way to kind of encapsulate that process, that use case in a way that can be reused. So in this case, we're just going to go along. Oh, no, it's not spacebar. Oh, it is? OK. We're basically just going to go along and we're actually going to choose a quick invoice template. And we're going to use that just to kind of describe a little bit about how Codexa works. Any minute now. I must have spoken more slowly when I did this, but OK, bear with me. So as soon as you click, oh, come on. As soon as you click the template, you can basically give it a name and a description. And then you'll end up in a project space. And a project space for us is, like I said, a place to capture a use case. You have an overview screen where you can kind of see the details of the project, uh, you know, the owner, the description. Uh, you can have statuses for projects, uh, all of this normal sort of stuff you would have around a kind of workflow to track things. And you also have what we call the workspace. And the workspace, which I'm hoping we're going to go to any minute, the workspace is basically going to be a place where you can capture your structure. So when you go to the workspace, you'll see on the left-hand side, you have the ability to store your documents. You can actually chat with documents over here, too. We have a concept called data forms. We'll come back to that. And we also have a concept called data definitions. And it's the data definition that tells us what we want to get from the document. And we can simply design that data definition in the UI. So we can decide what kind of information we'd like to capture. We can also decide information about that. We can decide if it's a currency. We can decide whether it's expected to be in the document. We can also include whether we want to include prompt information to help the system find it, semantic information that we think will include or benefit the model in understanding how it works. And once we have that information in place, that's everything we needed to set up 
in order for us to process documents. So you can go in quickly as a user, create the data definition you want, and basically lay out the information you want to get from the documents. One important thing is you can have as many data definitions as you want. So if you said you had a data definition for a driver's license, a data definition for a W-2, a data definition for a bank statement, the system will classify the individual pages and individual PDFs to work out which one they are while it's processing. We also have the ability to capture data that's not in the document. We have things called reviews, we have external data. And these allow us to combine more information in that process. So this is basically a rich UI to allow you to kind of set up that use case and get going quickly. And in a bit, we're going to also show you how you can define things like features and properties to allow you to understand how we influence the way that the machine learning and the, sorry, the generative AI is actually going to function. So with our data structure in place, we're going to kind of jump back and we're going to start to upload one of our documents. I said hopefully, because I'm trying to remember how many things I clicked around before I got there this morning. <clears throat> so uploading a document is really, really easy. You just go, you choose the document, you grab the one you want, you upload them into the system. When they get uploaded, they get processed by what we call assistance. And this is all actually configurable. We can configure any network setup you want with any model in the UI. In this case, we're actually going to be using Textract to OCR the documents because they, need, they were scans. Again, the system can be like configured and set up in ways to support different setups as needed. As soon as we have this, um, we're going to pass it onto our model, and then our model is going to be able to do more stuff. The other thing you note there is you can also, we didn't do it for this case. If I have large documents, I can request LLM embeddings be created at the beginning. And if that's true, then I can actually use the system will recognize that there are embeddings in the document, and it'll just de determine a different way to go through the document to find content. And that's how we work with sort of 1,000 page document. So the model then kicks into process. And so the processing is just as you'd mentioned. We go and basically construct a set of prompts. Those prompts run against the document and basically capture the data. And we just wait patiently while that happens. Probably could have edited this bit out in hindsight. Any minute now. Go, go, go. I feel like I should do a Muppet song. And there we go. When we capture the data from the document, we actually do it in two steps. The first thing we do is we label the document with everything that we found. This allows us to avoid hallucination because we're going to go back and determine where the data was that it said existed in the document before we extract it. We label everything in there with both the values and the labels, and those labels will match the data structure you defined at the beginning. And in fact, you can actually go back and change the labels if you want later if you believe that that can make things better. And we actually have a process that allows you to reverse that back in. So now we have all of our data extracted, and we have it all labeled. In a lot of our use cases, at this point, we would simply kick out, and now we would be publishing that data downstream. And so publishing to us is usually things like Azure or S3, or we can publish to Excel, those kind of tools. And we're basically creating data representations of the information that, again, exactly match the definition that you designed in the UI. So this process allows you to take a document that you want to go after with no technical support and basically go and build a process whereby you can capture the data and extract it as you want. Yep, so when, we add the, when you build that data structure, I think that's actually the end, uh, but yes, so when you build the data structure, it actually creates colors in the background, you can change the colors around, cho choose whatever you want, and that becomes the labeling structure as well. And the reason we do that is because what you've seen so far is really just the very first part. So if you imagine, most people start with the problem of how do I get some data off a page, right? But the problem with generative AI or, uh, or large language models is they're just not very good. And that's either they're not very good or they're just too expensive if you start using them a lot. And so you, as you mentioned before, there's constant trade 
between the model, like how much do I want to spend on a problem, and then how much do I want a human in a problem. And even if you go for a very expensive model, you'll probably end with a human in the loop anyway, because you don't really trust you know, final decisions. And especially if you're looking at something like spreading, where you're doing kind of financial spreading, you don't want to spread a million dollar deal and come back with an income statement and say, oh no, that looks great, like we should lend them the money and never actually look at the source document. And so to do that, we have a second part of our process, which we do, and I'm going to try and get to it. <laughs> Is it the second video? Yeah, I'll go. And I'm, I'm trying to move quickly. Kevin, I owe you a pint. Cool. So we're going to stick with invoices. This is a slightly different project, but only because we've added a couple of things to it in the UI. And those things that were added were actually added in the UI as well, right? So they weren't kind of custom code. The problem you have is that once a system captures data from a document, you have to trust it. And if you have to look at everything to trust something, there's no point having an AI. Like, we learned that the hard way. If you tell an analyst, go check all the numbers, they'll tell you they'll just type them all in again because it'll be easier than them going and checking the numbers. And so what we ended up having to do was try and work out how we could use data forms to allow us to present the data side by side with the document so that a person can quickly assess whether or not the data is correct. Okay. If you have a system, like and you're pulling a bank statement, you want to know exactly which data came from where, and you want to go through it in a form that's really, really, really fast. And so one of our first customers, for them, what they were very keen on was taking a time to, take, time to capture an invoice from one minute 40 seconds to less than 20 seconds. And they wanted to capture six times as much data in the same process. And so what we did was we took the layering system that we have and the labeling system that we have, and we basically went through that and we decided to build a data form system that lets us present the data as well. And so what that means is that when I go in, and I'm gonna get there in a second, I'm sure. When I go into a bill and I have, <coughs> um, processed the data out of it, like I have here, and I've kind of captured it. This view, while very colorful, and I do like the colors, but isn't very easy to actually assess if it was right, okay? So what we do is we have the ability, and I'll just pull this out here so you can see the rest of the details. I'm gonna remove myself as an assignee, and I'm gonna to go to a tab called Verification Station, and it's gonna assign that document to me that stops two people working on it. And if I now open it up, as I click through the form on the left-hand side, which is custom designable, can be designed in the UI, it's gonna take me through the document to assess what's correct and what isn't correct. The other thing we've done is when we built that data definition, we extended it so that we could have things like formulas and rules. And that's another reason that allows us to very, very quickly determine whether the total build amount doesn't add up. The, you know, the account number has the legal characters in it. And the reason we built that into the UI was because a data entry person wants to be able to fix something and immediately see exceptions clearing. They don't want to fix everything and press submit. They want to be interactively going through and saying, I fix that, exception's gone. Fix that, that's no longer read. Fix that, that's gone. And they want to be guided towards the area they're likely to have to focus on. So if they're looking at 60 to 80 attributes, you need them to focus on seven or eight that's going to clear the problem. And that is basically the second side of our offering, is basically allowing you to do that work very, very quickly, and allowing you to take not just the AI on its own, where you kind of have a trust problem, but basically wrapping it in a user experience so that someone can very, very quickly validate, become comfortable, and move on, and then still get the value of the AI, but not lose you know, the, the comfort in the data that they're receiving. And so that is 
a very brief introduction. There's lots of other things we do, um, but that's a kind of quick introduction to Codexa and uh, our approach to uh, document processing and uh, document automation workflows. And I'm sorry the video is so out of sync. But <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. And where do they go if they want to learn more information? Oh, Codexa.ai Codexa or Tim? Or Tim. <laughs> okay. Tim.ai? <laughs> so hopefully you've seen, and we're, we're wrapping up here, but hopefully you've seen the, um, the difference between the, the, the three different demos we, 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 we sent to you, so, or we presented today. So the first demo, Victorious, was just uh, a team of two working on this for a couple of days, maybe a week. Um, and that's why, you know, it was kind of the bare bones. It, it just kind of did what it needed to do. Um, and then we had the, the, the statement, the bank statement ingestion, um, and that was six weeks worth of work, six weeks of work, worth of work uh, over with a couple of people on the team. Um, and it's a much more robust platform than Victorious. Um, and then Codexa being a full-fledged SaaS platform that's been around for four years. Four years. So you, you can see how the, the, the solutions get more mature, more mature, more mature. So you start off with an idea. Can you actually do this? Then you, and, and Austin's like, there's no way you can do that. But you spend all the time doing a POC, um, and you prove that it can work. Then you go build that business case, and then you go build more stuff on top of it. So that's our document ingestion uh, demos for today. Um, Next K Kingsman AI in action is October 3rd, so save the date. And thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, we've got our... I had little Easter eggs in there. I forget about it. Hmm? I don't know yet. We haven't, we haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> it's a stock forecaster? I mean, we also have a couple of these, um, uh, you've got microphones, right, for questions? Uh, we also have a couple of Microsoft uh, Copilots that we've built. So Microsoft Copilot Studio allows you to build some Copilots in, uh, in, in, the, in the Microsoft platform. So you're not building something as a bespoke application and deploying it. You can kind of leverage Microsoft's uh, suite of tools that connects out the data sources. You could interact your, with a chat bot, have some UI to it. Uh, it can be integrated with your teams and whatnot. So we might do a little bit of that, a little bit of that. Yeah. Questions? Ken, this, the, this is a response to your comment on a survey. I'm calling you out on it. You're like, can we see some more business use cases? So those are real business use cases. There's a good ROI on document ingestion, right? Because right now, you might use some OCR or um, m mostly using humans and where you can cut down the cost of a human looking at it. Or you can cut down the amount of time when you submit your mortgage application documents as, a, as, a, as an applicant. I want instant feedback. Hey, we're missing page three. Why didn't you tell me that when I uploaded it? When I uploaded it? Um, and so by giving that, that information back quickly, as opposed to a couple days later, then, then the, um, the, the person can fix that quickly, get the mortgage going faster. One of the things that was interesting for us was we typically started believing everything was an efficiency play. Like, you know, people came to us because they wanted to fire people. I mean, I started IT in the 90s. My whole job was building things to fire people. But what we've discovered is because the AI isn't very good, right, it's quite, I mean, it looks good, <laughs> but the wheels come kind of off the edges quite a bit. What we've seen is a lot of it is starting to play into the idea that, like, I can make my staff more effective. I can't necessarily just get rid of them, but they can do more. And so what they start to do is opportunistic work. And so when we did spreading, it was interesting to us. They told us how many customers needed to spread, which was a few thousand. They had about 200 analysts. And so we were sort of in our head thinking, you know, are you gonna, how many are you gonna fire like, if we do this? But the actual premise was, you know, we don't spread speculative deals. We don't look at a customer we don't have and spread that customer to see if we get the money because we don't have the capacity to do that. But if we could do it really fast, then basically we actually get a new market opportunity, right? And when we talked to the people that we do invoice processing for, their big, in fact, we had this, their biggest interest 
is really around capturing more data. They're basically trying to become data rich so that they can build data products for their customers as well. That doesn't necessarily mean getting rid of people or just efficiency. It, then it becomes new product opportunity as well and time to market for that. So, just wanted to add that. Yeah, great. Would you expect in the future that it is going to be headcount cutting? I'm going to repeat that just so we have it for the recording. Would you expect that in the future to be headcount cutting? Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think there's definitely. Headcount reallocation is what I've heard more than straight cutting. So it's more, can I, if I can fortify a process more, can I become less dependent on incumbent staff and have the ability to potentially offshore again? That's one. Um, but that's typically tended to be in like, you know, data entry level work. Um, I would say in the analyst, like the, the white collar level work that we do, where it's kind of, uh, you know, audit, lending decisions, I haven't seen that cutting other than cutting IT stuff. So we, there's a, you know, if you think of the, of the, the moniker that like, you know, software eats the world, well, AI eats software, right? Is basically what it does, right? And as it eats software, it eats IT because it's changing the relationship between IT and the business. And I think there's going to be changes in the next kind of decade around that, predominantly probably around the role of IT being less as a manufacturer of software and more as a governor of data, which, you know, they've said they've done for a decade, but I think most IT departments would admit they're not necessarily really into looking after data, but they really like building things. So I think that shift will probably occur, in my mind at least. Yes. And I've seen that not necessarily cutting, but not adding. Um, IBM about a year ago came out and said, we're going to remove 5,000 jobs in our back office over the next five years. But the way they're doing that is they're just not hiring into those roles, and they're waiting for natural attrition or people to move up to other roles uh, and not backfilling that. Um, so where you have analysts that are sp doing the statement spreading, and you have 10 of them, but they grow up into higher roles, then you're only backfilling with five analysts or something like that. So not really letting go, but, but reallocation of resources. Any other questions? One more. You want to wait for the mic this time? <laughs> Rush Mealy has so many steps t this today, because we, we had a conference earlier today. How long do you think it'll be before you get good data in and you don't have the hallucinations and you don't have to have somebody check the data? Is, I mean, is that a possible thing anytime soon? I think, I think you can get there. I think the challenge is the controls that you put in place to, to do that. Right, I think what's, what we've seen is, um, and this is very, very early for us, prompt engineering is, is a bit like development. Like, you know, that, those first steps are a bit like development. And most people want to move from that into a controlled process. Lots of processes are controlled. And, the challenge, and, and it used to be that they never got adopted, certainly in the document space, because the variability was too high. So let me try and give you an example. Go back to spreading. So if you get a customer and you, 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 you look at their financials, you know, 2022 financials, you as an analyst might say, you know, I don't think that's quite right. I think it should be like this. And you now expect the machine to kind of learn from that and, and kind of move forward. For you to have like 100% confidence, you'd end up having to wrap that control layer Right? And today, the way that most financial services companies would do that is that they would have a middle office function that would validate some audit, or you, if you're a you know, data company, you'd have a qualas, a quality check group that would validate that work. I don't think we're going to get to a state where the model independently is trusted. I think we're going to get to a state where the model is monitored by a number of other models, and in that network, we build trust. So we don't build trust in a single model or a single 
you know, pipeline, we build trust by that pipeline, has a second pipeline, which is monitoring that pipeline and questioning it to determine whether or not it's correct. In the same way that today in most companies, whether it's an audit function, turning up and wanting to go through all your stuff to make sure you actually did it, or whether it's a quality check team on a production line where it's like there's somebody further down the line making sure that happened that's not you, I think that's probably how we'll build trust in data uh, with AI. And I think that, that process is gonna take a bit of time to kind of work out, because a lot of people don't have <coughs> well-organized quality control. Does that help? Yeah. I know in the regulatory space, they always talk about 4i approval. So you look at something, and then you approve it, and then it comes to me, then I look at it. We got 4i's looking at it. Um, you remember that, John, right? <laughs> um, but uh, in this case, the AI could be the first set of eyes, and then a human is the second set of eyes. And there's also, like, like th there's, a, there's a question as to what is perfect quality perfect quality uh, and what's the value of that to you. So if we talk bank, bank statements for an application for a mortgage, do you need to be exactly 100% accurate every time you do it or is some level of inaccuracy okay that doesn't affect the outcome, right? So if you're 99% right or you're 99.9% .9 right or you're 98%, like what point is acceptable to you? Because the cost is, increment, is, is exponentially higher. Um, and so yet that's where we, we listed that listing of the models, accuracy, cost, speed, things like that. Pick the ones that matter most to your situation. Um, and maybe quality is not great, not because it's not, it's fine because you're making bigger decisions based on that data. But if it has to be hundred percent right, then put one model for first set of eyes, another model for a second set of eyes, and then a human if you need it. And it costs more. So if it, it costs more, so if that's needed for your scenario, you're probably gonna need it anyway. But the models are pretty good these days. I mean, compared to a year ago, compared to two years ago. One of the ones we set up, you mentioned um, 3.5. <clears throat> so one of the things we've, we've done is, well, we didn't get to it in the slides, but we have a thing called an explain view, where if you click on a document, it's gonna show you like how the LLM broke out its workload, it's chunking and all that sort of stuff. And one of the things you do there is we quite often will ask cheap LLMs to have a go. And then we'll ask, an and then ask another cheap LLM if it thought that the first cheap LLM was doing okay. And then we'll ask it a second time. And if the second time it's still booming and ring, we'll bring in a more expensive LLM to try and ask it why it thinks the first ones were wrong and then go back. Because what you're trying to do is build in just the same way you would in like a huge process. You're trying to build a process where it's like, you know, we, I don't, we don't want to drop out to somebody. If we want, we can iterate on it, you know, then we're more likely to keep those processes going. And we also do a similar thing where we actually use a large AI model, which is too expensive for some of our use cases. It makes like $2 to use 3.5 to process a document, to use that as a way to inform cheaper models on how to break down their work um, in order to do the job. So I think what you're gonna see around like how to build trust is a, you know, a kind of gang of LLMs attacking a problem together versus us just choosing an LLM every time kind of thing. A, a gang of LLMs? <laughs> One last question. <clears throat> They're like drink tickets, you get two. <laughs> in discussions with actual customers and you talk about what level of accuracy do you need? people settling out of what, 75, 90%, 98%, w what's reality? Yeah. So reality is a lot more surprising than I thought. So when we were working with the bank, when we only had 97% on 3.5, I was like, oh, there's, there's no way, they're gonna, they're gonna want 99.999%. They were like, 97, that's incredible. And I was like, it, it, it is incredible, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking. And um, it kind of made you realize that these things that they have in place are probably not as accurate as you're thinking they are. And that was kind of the thing that gave us confidence as we were going through the process. Is we were shooting for such a high standard, but we realized that just even at 97%, we were already improving so much of what they were already doing. So I think to add to all their points, like we started thinking of like concepts of them of, you know, what if we added cheaper models to sort of, you know, they were always 100%. What if we added those to handle your, you know, your lower use cases and then the more complex use cases, we added in the more expensive models. So that's kind of where, you know, the brain started churning and we were like, we could make this work on an enterprise level for you. Yep. 
All right, well, thank you, everyone. We're a little bit over, but I appreciate you staying. Let's go grab a beer and do some networking. Thank you very much. Was it recorded? It was recorded. Yeah? For realsy? For realsy? Okay, where do you want to be?